I know as I look over the billboard and the jumbotron in New York City, um, I know that this uh, lighting is just horrible. I won't be making too many more um, uh, videos in here um, unless I get some better lighting, and that's for sure. But how y'all doing today, Emily? Haven't saw you in a while, and I know y'all ain't seen me, so hey. Let's uh let's get into this story right here. Okay, because it's uh pretty interesting, especially for those who are re in recovery, have recovered from something, who have this to something. I for one have been an addicted to uh and I know how difficult this is to uh stop using whatever your um drug of choice is. It's, it's very uh, hard to break addiction and I commend and I respect anyone who has um, uh, um, actually is a survivor listen uh, Eminem was taking 30 Vicodin a day and nearly died after consuming an equivalent of four bags of heroin before unlikely friend Elton John saved his life isn't that interesting? Hip hop and rap artist Eminem was taking up to 30 Vicodin a day and nearly died of an overdose before receiving help from Elton John, the new book obtained by Daily Mail reveals. The 15 time Grammy Award artist, uh, known offstage as Marshall Mathers, was rushed to the hospital two hours away from death in 2007 after consuming the equivalent of four bags of freaking heroin. The blue collar kid and one time dishwasher from Detroit tried to get clean but re would relapse two or more times before reaching out to British singer who became his sponsor in essence and saved his life. As a fellow musical superstar with nearly 30 years of sobriety under his belt Elton John was the perfect mentor to help guide Marshall Rise, writes the author Anthony Boza in his new biography, Not Afraid, The Evolution of Eminem. The two started on a program of weekly check-ins and grew very close. Wow. Isn't that interesting? I think Eminem used to call him names at one point. Anyway... Um, M. Elton remained true to his friendship with the rapper despite Eminem's purportedly homophobic lyrics and they famously performed a duet together in 2001. I didn't know he was gay, Eminem 40 said, 47 said in 2004. I didn't really care. Elton never viewed Eminem as homophobic but saw him as just writing about the way things are, Elton said, before declaring his love for him. I love you too, Eminem responded. When he emerged on the music scene in the mid-90s as his alter ego, my name is, my name is, my name is, Slim Shady, he was an outliner, a white artist, and a black medium, and his shockingly honest lyrics resonated universally. From a broken trailer park home, he was a white man in an African-American game and nearly died from the side effects of success, writes Boza. Faye hit me like a fucking ton of bricks, writes Eminem. He worked hard but partied even harder and was out of control consuming drugs and alcohol, carrying a concealed weapon, getting involved in fights, and fighting endless lawsuits. Drugs and alcohol and alcohol helped fill the void of what was an empty life with a broken family and an endless life on the road. His father, Marsha Bruce Masters Jr., skipped out on his 15-year-old mother, Debbie, an alcoholic and an addict, when he was born. His mom kept getting evicted from trailer parks, moving between Michigan and Missouri, and taking her son with her. Debbie finally settled in a crack-infested neighborhood in Detroit 
and continued to physically beat up her son. She invited a runaway, a 13-year-old Kimberly Scott, to live with them, and Eminem began a relationship with her when he was 15. As a teen, he preferred to read comic books instead of schoolwork and dropped out at 17 after repeating the ninth grade three times. He married Kim when his career was taken off in 1999, but it was an ill-fated love-hate relationship. <laughs> the two tried marriage again in 2006, but this time it only lasted three months. I would rather have a baby through my penis than to get married again, Marshall said at the time. Wow. The couple's tumultuous relationship produced a daughter, Haley, in 1995, and she would become the subject of many of his songs. In 2000, Kim filed a defamation suit against her ex-husband to get him to stop rapping about her. And when she, uh, around the same time, his mother had filed a $10 million lawsuit claiming slander, but was only awarded $1,600. When he pistol whipped a man, he saw kiss his estranged wife. He landed in jail with an assault and a gun charge, three years probation, as well as regular drugs tests. He could afford the fuck you money he paid lawyers to handle the lawsuit, which have continued, costing him an estimated $4.7 million annually in legal fees. So he had to clean up his act. The rapper's drug and alcohol intake soared after the murder of Deshaun Proof Holton in 2006. The pioneer of the Detroit hip hop music and Eminem's best friend and collaborator. Following Proof's murder, Eminem became hooked on opiates and benzodiazepines. Some days I would just lay in bed, take pills and cry. I needed pills in my body just to feel normal so I would be sick. It was a vicious cycle. His health and diet also took a big hit as he was eating all the meals at McDonald's, Taco Bell, Diddy's, or Big Boy. I got so heavy that people started not to recognize me, he said. I heard one kid said, that's Eminem. The other said, no, that's not him. Eminem ain't fat. Wow. His drug abuse, I was like, damn. Wow. Whenever people told him he had a problem, he'd say, Get that fucking person out of here. They don't know nothing about my fucking life. Kind of like how Michael Jackson was. In sheer denial. I'm not out here shooting heroin. I'm not out here putting coke. I'm not out here putting coke up my nose. I'm not smoking crack. But he was consuming up to 30 Vicodins a day. And sometimes 40 to 60 Valium per day. Every day my regimen would be wake up in the morning, take extra strength Vicodin, which is a combination of acetaminophen and high acetaminophen and hydrocodone and opioid pain med. His early evening drug was a Valium, no less than four, and every hour on the hour, four or five more. Ambient a sedative hypnotic let him fall asleep for maybe two hours before he got up to down more. He switched from Vicodin to Methadone. Easier on the liver and a typical justification for addicts who switch to heroin from opioids. Mm. The rush was great, but one wasn't enough and he consumed the methadone indiscriminately until he collapsed and couldn't get up. 
He woke up in the ICU and was told that he had taken the equivalent of four bags of heroin. My organs were shutting down. My liver, kidneys, they were going to have to put me on dialysis. They didn't think I was going to make it. My bottom was going to be to death, he said. But it wasn't the final wake-up call because he relapsed two more times and realized that he was going to die. He found help and support by making contact from an unlikely companion, which is Elton John, who helped him get his life back together. Giving up his addiction to drugs, he replaced it with an addiction to writing. His troubled background from a bleak childhood in the ghetto and an abusive mother gave him plenty of material. But his focus was diverted oddly to learning as much as he could about serial killers before writing his album, Really Relapse. I just got into it and I started on this weird serial killer vibe, he said. I did find myself watching a lot of documentaries about serial killers. I've always been intrigued by them and watching movies like that. I found that going back through my DVD collection and watching movies about killers sparked something in me. The way a serial killer mind works, just the psychology of them, is pretty fucking crazy. I was definitely inspired by that. Yeah, that is pretty freaking weird to be inspired by serial killers. I mean, really? He referenced, um, let's see, he referenced a specific victim of a killer in his lyrics that were considered psycho, but they pushed his music right up the charts. He found an audience for his writing about evil demons torturing him in his sleep. On his musical, su his musical success, that landed him in a rarefied company with Jay-Z, Kanye West, he became controversial in his parody of Michael Jackson in 2004. Eminem's video for Just Lose It included a skit re uh, referencing the child molestation allegations against Jackson, his rhinoplasty, and his hair catching fire. Jackson and Stevie Wonder reacted negatively in Steve Harvey's radio show even declared Eminem has lost his ghetto pass. We want that pass back. BET pulled the music video, but MTV continued to air it. Eminem had planned to promote the album, but he suddenly found himself emotionally marooned in a self-imposed exile. He once took aim at MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice, Britney Spears, NSYNC, saying they didn't deserve their success. Now he's turned his attack on Senator Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Bill Cosby, and a counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway. But he saved his most intense venom and long rants about Donald Trump. The disrespect he has shown the country and the catastrophic damage he is doing to the fabric of the nation. He makes my blood boil. Eminem said, the most important thing to remember about Eminem and his legacy as not a rapper, but as a white rapper is he had, what he achieved pretty much the impossible. Commercial, pop, and critical success in a genre that was never intended to be a form of expression for the race, writes author Anthony Boza. Mm. Well, you know, that's very interesting. I heard that he had a heroin addiction. I didn't know it was that bad, but um, thank God he got over it. All right, y'all leave y'all comments below. Did y'all know that Eminem suffered from that, uh, you know, hyperactivity when it came to taking opioids and stuff? Let me know. Leave your comments below and I'll see you in the next video.